Alright, I'm going to do a quick review. This is completely unscripted, so bear with me on this. Of uh, Ascension Skulls and Sails. So we're going to go over briefly what things make this game tick and why it's different from other Ascension. The first thing I need to show you is the board. The board has this layout where the center row cards are over off to the edge and there's a zone in the middle for ships. I should grab a ship. Here's a ship. You put your little ship counters on these and then you move them around the seas. The location your ship is in is important because the card that's here you can buy or defeat using crew. These little wheels allow you to go up higher and higher crew amounts stacking from turn to turn until you get to nine crew. You can spend it at any time. If you want to kill a two cost monster then just spend two and destroy the thing that's there. Resetting yourself back to zero. If you want to buy a thing that costs two and you have four you just set yourself back down to two. Those wheels are actually very nice compared to other games with wheels. I'm going to set it at two and I'm just going to drop it on the board as an example. It stays there. It doesn't really bump around and have big issues with the components and let that focus back in. Anyway, the other thing that's important is the deep here. This is a seventh spot in the center row that is reserved for a very specific card I'm about to show you once I take the deck away. To give you an overview of this board, the other side of it's got your normal stacks of stuff. Set the camera off to the side and get rid of my board. Alright. Now, of the ships you can have, each one of these ships has artwork from a card in the set. You can have your Void, Lifebound, Enlightened, or Mechana is your overall basic here. First thing that is important in this game is the gold. There are 16 gold cards that are shuffled into the deck, just like previous treasure sets that had to do with energy. When you acquire a card with gold underneath it, and it could have multiple, when you flip a gold you just keep flipping from the deck, you just take it and put it in front of you. The previous energy sets made this be a card in your deck. Instead this goes straight to a score pile, I leave it kind of by my constructs, and just have a pile of gold stacking up. Each gold is worth a point at the end of the game, but it can be rated by other players, and many cards get more powerful if you have enough treasure in your treasure loot. Not only are there 16 gold, but there are 6 crystals of command. If you think that's too many or too few, you can blame me because I gave them the recommendation to use 6 and did a whole bunch of math to prove to them why I thought 6 was ideal. My goal was not to make it like Valley, where one or two of these changing hands in the middle of the game would make someone go from 25 points to 9 points and someone else go from 25 points to 49 points. That's just too much of a swing. There's still a decent amount of swing on the last turn for these Crystals of Command, so going second might be better than you think it is. Alright. This I promised I would tell you about. This is Thukul the Kraken. The Kraken hangs out in the deep. He's a 9 cost monster. The main thing you need to know about him is what happens if you enter his space. There are many cards in the game that have fates on them. When they hit the center row, they drag your ships around the board towards the Kraken, or towards the card itself. If you ever get drug onto Thukul or you voluntarily move there, anytime a ship enters his space, he steals a treasure from them and puts it underneath him. If a person ends their turn on him, they put another treasure under him. If you have already moved on your turn, you get one free movement each turn, by the way. You can use it before, after, whatever, just the first turn of the game you have to place your ship. And then each turn you have the opportunity to move at most once, unless a card says otherwise. If you get drug onto him after you've moved, he takes a treasure, you end your turn, he takes another treasure. It does happen twice. Eight point monster to kill and you get all the treasure underneath him. More importantly, you are now the Kraken for the rest of the game. Once per turn you can raid another ship that's in the same location as you. That is very powerful and very good late game. Most games end within a turn or two of him being defeated, so don't think it's going to be something you really need to rush for early. If you get it too early, you might actually have hurt yourself. We'll see more about that in a bit. Let's move on to the cards. We're going to go through the monsters first and show you what kind of good things you can be wanting to defeat. The Bane Swarm. First thing about the Bane Swarm I want to point out, do you see this gold border around it? Everything in this set that has the keyword anchor on it 
is going to have that border defect. And I'm actually going to make this camera get closer to my stack and resume it in. There, that's larger and probably easier for you to read. Anchor means if your ship is in the same corresponding location to the card, you get this bonus effect. So it's just a cultist, two power for a point, unless you happen to be in its spot, in which case you banish a card in your hand or discard pile. Fair warning, I am a huge fan early in the game when a Bane Sworn comes out of getting two crew on my ship and using it to get rid of my militia in my hand or discard pile. I don't wait for my opponent to have a shot, I just get a card out of my deck as fast as possible using this. And there are four of those in the deck. Next up is Call of the Deep. This is our first fade effect. Whenever a Call of the Deep is first flipped down into the center, all ships move one space towards the Kraken. Since there are seven spaces on the board, you can never be equidistant from the Kraken. It's always clear which direction you're pulled. On that note, ships can move clockwise or counterclockwise, but they can never jump from one side of the board to the other. Right up by where the Mystics and Heavies are, there's a loop around space. It's got a very clear graphic showing that those are connected. But clockwise, counterclockwise tends to make that clear for people. This allows you to raid a ship in any space. That's just taking one of their treasure, putting it in your pile. And there's not one, two, three, four of these. There's actually five, six of them. Lots of these. They're going to make you move a lot, but raiding is really important. Forced movement's really important. Here is our next forced movement card. Stone Siren pulls ships two spaces towards it. You cannot defeat the Stone Siren with crew. This will is kind of an interesting balance because in this game I found a lot of players will go all runes or all power and a little bit of crew either way and they will always use the crew to do the thing they're not good at. If they have a buying deck they're going to use their crew to kill monsters. If they have a killing deck they're going to use their crew to buy really big cards just by stacking it up turn after turn until they can. Well the Stone Siren lets you turn power into three crew and two points really really good to get that three crew but be afraid of that a little bit I'm gonna go ahead and jump to a card a little further in here the next fade is the Wraith Squid if a ship has five or more crew it loses two when this hits the center row the worst thing that can happen to you is kill a stone siren go up to five or more and the Wraith Squid immediately takes two away that really really stinks happens to all of us though all right, going back to where I was. Bombfish, next cost card. Three points and banish a card in your hand or discard pile. Anchor, do it again. This is another one of my favorite cards to kill early, either by getting some sail slashers you're going to see in a minute um, to kill it quickly, or by using, oh, I don't know, four crew. Automatically having my anchor effect because my ship has to be there to use my crew and getting rid of cards aggressively. If I don't have a discard pile, I will, if I'm in the first five turns of the game, kill cards in my hand and avoid buying even three and four cost cards that I really wanted. It's better for the banish, I promise you. The density of your good effects in this set is going to do more for you than anything else. There aren't a lot, lot of banishers, but there's a reasonable enough amount that if you prioritize them, you can go to town. All right, there's just three of those. Next up are the four Diamond Beaks. Diamond Beaks cost four, and they're the one way you can destroy constructs with a cheap monster. There's another big construct that destroy, or a big monster that destroys them as well. If you have three or more treasure, you actually destroy two of their constructs. Very nice. Wraith Squid I already showed you because I wanted to talk about its fate effect right away. But its normal reward is four points, draw a card. If you happen to have had your ship there, you draw two cards. That two card draw is way better than you think it is. Oh my goodness, does that win games in the end and just really set off the combos. I mean, no one's going to undervalue card draw. Next up we have the Shallow Noose. This is an absolutely terrifying monster. Five cost, four points. It's not as good as... Uh, like a giant from Realms Unraveled that's a four cost for five points. But here's the kicker. If you have three treasure, it becomes eight points for five cost. Even if you have to smack this thing going way out of your way to get it, just for the four, if your opponent has treasure, you need to be afraid of that eight. It is very vital. 
Next up we have the spawn of Thukul. Here is yet another fate. Move all ships two spaces towards the Kraken. There's two of these in the deck, so that makes eight things that pull you towards the Kraken. And I think it was four things that pull you away. Maybe it was only three. Only three stone sirens that pull you away from the Kraken. Well, potentially. It could actually pull you through the Kraken on the way to the stone siren. All right. Spawn a Thukul, raid a ship in any location twice. Another really good way to make treasure swing at the end of the game. When you get those crystals of command moving with it, that becomes really awesome. And finally, we have our big nasty. Six points, choose a player, take every crew that they have, destroy every construct they have. Wonderful card. There's only one of these. This is the second biggest monster, because the biggest monster, the Kraken, is always available to kill. So don't think that, oh no, this is like a low-valued guy. No, nope, he's the biggest one in the deck now. Taking all of the crew at the right time is super important. If I have seven crew and my opponent has three or four, I'm going to kill this with my crew just to take theirs. Putting them back to zero, and me halfway up to the Kraken or whatever that I'm saving for, I'd still rather than do that than just risk it. Alright, that's it for the monsters. Next, I had the Life Mound deck closer, so I'm going to go through that. This is another set that has one-cost, one-time use cards. So all of the one-cost cards in this set are going to have the same formula of do something specific to the faction, gain one crew, banish it. Vineslingers is three points. Solid. There's only two of these, so they're not huge, huge, huge swings you're going to see all the time, but they still make a big impact on the game. Title Claws. Draw a card. If you can unite it, you get a crew. I mean, it's a two-cost card that's worth a point. It draws a card to replace itself. You can't go wrong with that. It helps set off every unite in your deck. That's not a card to go out of my way to get, until I start a lifebound game going, but it's certainly nothing I'm ever going to be mad putting in my deck because it cannot hurt me. Talons of Amaruk. Two runes, raid. This is a great way to swing uh, treasure. Most of the raid cards are on the power cards, so this is the way to build a rune deck that still raids. There's three of these in the deck. Being lifebound is quite good in this set. There's plenty of lifebound interaction that you're going to like. Nothing wrong with that at all. Diana's Wind Raiders. This one, a three cost to gain three points every time you play it. It's not excellent, excellent. But if you're going to go for a lifebound void deck, if you're going to go for a heavy banish deck, if you're going to save up crew for the Kraken as fast as possible, and you're going to be smacking monsters regularly, you can end the honor pool well before anyone's ready. As far as the pacing goes in Skulls and Sail, this card is very important for keeping the pacing quick, and the game ends fast, no one gets these massive 100 point final turns. Very much like it for that reason, I don't overvalue it, I'm not going to go out of my way to get it. But there it is. Now we have two of these Hurricane Shamans. The Hurricane Shamans have this nice ability that you can move your ship in extra space. That's much more valuable than you think it is. Having flexibility move around the map will let you get in position to raid. And the anchor put a hero on top of your deck if you buy it in the place your ship is. Really effective. Alright, here's my favorite card. Some of you might be wondering, well, why is this your favorite card? It looks all right. No, no, no. It's not about the card. It's about the artwork. This is the turtle ship. This, I am going to claim, is my unofficial card. I have gotten second and third and so many U.S. and world championships for Ascension. Won the uh, Shards of Infinity championship last year. Got second this year. But I haven't won the honor of putting my face on a card. So, they at least made me a turtle ship. Let's be honest, I helped playtest this set. We're going to claim it was intentional, whether it was or not. Anyway, it gives you a rune every turn, and it says, When you play a lifebound hero, gain a crew. 
This is actually probably a mistake that we should have fixed. It does not say once per turn if you play a lifebound hero gain a crew. It says every time. So the more lifebound you have, the more crazy this card gets. And that gets crazy fast. Do not undervalue this card. Then we have our two Rapto Raiders that cost five. The Rapto Raiders give you a little bit of everything, two runes, two power. It's like a heavy and a mystic combined, and it's got this plunder effect. We've seen plunder before in Deliverance for people who have seen that set. Uh, this is if you acquire any card, and if you defeat any monster on the same turn, when you have this plunder effect, you get a bonus. In this case, more crew. Very solid. It's just a freebie. Don't go out of your way to make that go off repeatedly. Alright, between the 6 cost and the 7 cost card in this set, I want to talk about the 7 first. The 7 gives you a little bit of everything. 2 runes, 2 power, 2 points, 2 crew. <laughs> there is no way you can say anything bad about that card. It is wonderful. The reason I wanted to talk about it first though, is this is better. This Cat Tiger Siren is draw a card, so it doesn't hurt you to have in your deck. It's 4 points for 6 cost, nice solid ratio. I mean, a Tux was 5, but it cost one more as well. Here's where it's stupid. Gain honor equal to the cost of the next card you acquire or defeat. Not the honor value of the card you acquire, not the honor value of the monster you defeat, the cost. So if you kill the Kraken after playing Cat, you're getting 8 points for the Kraken and 9 points for Cat's effect. If you buy a big Mechanic Construct, you get full value twice. Even if you buy something like a Tux, well, you're getting the 5 for the card and another full 7 for the cost. One of the reasons I say this is so vital is in a set like this, you can keep stacking your crew over and over and over until it's huge. I've even overflowed crew at 9 before, waiting for cards to come out that were high enough cost. I didn't want to waste my crew on a 5 cost, I'd just buy a 4 cost and get my 4 points with cap, wait till the next time I draw it, and then try to get an 8 or a 9 point swing with it using my crew to pick up the biggest thing I can. The fact that Thukul's always out there is normally really effective for it. If I've already killed him or someone else beat me to it, then I might have to improvise on something else. But this card is just so swingy. It doesn't hurt you once you have it in deck. It replaces itself. You have full value in your turn, and you get a huge point swing. Definitely the best life mount card in here. The Hakua is actually probably the second best. A Tux, it's nice. It's wonderful. It's really not the end-all be-all of where life bounds at in this set, though. All right, let's move on to Void. Again, we have our one-cost cards that banish themselves. Surprising everyone, since Lifebound gave us three points, Void gives us two power. All of them give a crew. Enough said. Also, they're friendly pirate monkeys. They're cute, too. That's all. Knock is Storm Serpents. It's a two-power card for two costs, so it's literally just a heavy infantry, but if you can collect enough power, it becomes a three-power card. It's nice, nothing super special there. There's three of those in the deck. Now the Rum Guard. This is actually a card that people debate about all the time. How valuable is a Rum Guard? He gives you one crew, which you can stack from turn to turn until you get something awesome. He lets you banish a card in your hand or discard pile. Uh, it's a banish, but you only played four cards that turn. Gaining a crew all on its own, it really wasn't all that exciting. If you get a Rum Guard in the first two turns, absolutely go for it. I would even sacrifice sometimes buying a 5 cost card in favor of this and a Mystic. Assuming that 5 cost wasn't like a Hakua. <laughs> Most of the time I would forgo it to get a Rum Guard and a Mystic though. Early Banish, so good. If it's mid game, I'm honestly going to consider never touching this card because of how many cards I banish and how more, how frequently I would have drawn the card I banished, I might only see one more card later in the game that I got a better upgrade of instead. Well, I'm still going to have to draw the Rum Guard as a dead card, so killing a different dead card with it to draw only one of these two dead cards one more time, uh, I might be overcomplicating that, but. 
this has a sharp drop off in timing during the game. You don't want it late in the game. Early, absolutely wonderful. Here's one of my favorite. Do not underestimate the sail slasher because of this anchor effect. Early in the game, you can position your ship really well so that you can pick this up straight to your hand to gain two more power. If I have one militia, I pick up a sail slasher. I have three, I can kill a nice monster. Maybe I didn't have any, and I can just pick this up and kill one of those uh, two-cost Bane Swarms and banish a card. So awesome. Also, Echo. Echo's really easy to set off. I can buy a Void card before playing this from my hand, so that I guarantee one's in my discard pile to get this extra crew. The crew's really not all that important. The fact that you can pick it up when you buy it, if your ship is there... That's what makes the Sail Slasher so dangerous. Just leaving it on the field offers that opportunity to your opponent. All right, the Black Scales. We're jumping straight from threes to fives. This is easily one of the more powerful Void cards in this set. Three power. We've already seen a two-cost card that if you have enough treasure is already three power. So the three power is nice on a card. It's very predictable and understandable. But the Raid twice. There are several cards we haven't seen yet that prevent raiding. First time you're raided, you ignore it. At least I don't think we've seen any of those yet. Maybe I went over a lifebound one really quickly and didn't talk about it, but I don't think I did. Regardless, raid twice. They can prevent the first one. They can never prevent the second, even if they have two cards that say it. They always say prevent the first. Definite swings and points. Taking a point from them, adding it to you, even if it's just gold, each raid is like a two-point swing. Definitely worth having. Alright, this is where we start to get stupid. Scorn of Emery. Return a Void card in your discard pile to your hand. If you have enough draw in your deck, this card becomes way better than anything. So much better than anything you can think of, because if you can draw through your deck so that you shuffle immediately, whatever card you had returned and played is going to go back to your discard pile at the end of the turn. As long as you never catch yourself drawing part of a hand, then shuffling and drawing again, you're always going to have a discard pile. Heavy draw decks love the Scorn of Emery. Permanently keep a void card just bouncing back to your hand over and over and over. Also, some of the other void cards get insane when you can do this repeatedly. This one, four power and an extra power for every void card in your discard pile. That doesn't suck. It's also not super spectacular. It's exactly what you think it is. Great way to get after those big monsters. Here's where it's stupid. This is the Emery of this set. Knock a black blade. Gain four crew. That's massive on its own. You can easily get up to buying a massive eight cost mechanic construct a 9 cost Kraken, 7 cost Monster, so many things you can get to when you gain 4 all at once on top of everything else your deck is gaining. But here's where it's silly. Your ship is considered to be on the void and can defeat monsters there. This is very important. It says it may defeat monsters there. Your ship is how that sentence started. Not you, your ship. You can only kill monsters in the void using crew, not using power. That's a common misconception where people get, Oh my gosh, I'm just going to start doing an Emery thing and kill everything in the void. Well, you can, but only if you can keep the power train going. So many of these monsters in the set had those anchor effects, like draw an extra card if you kill it when you're on top of it. Well, now you're on top of it if you kill it in the void. Banish extra cards. There's so much you can do with this knock a black blade and go absolutely crazy. Any monster you kill from the void goes to the bottom of the center deck, so you can't do it forever. But Scorn of Emery, knock a black blade, heavy draw deck, and you can keep this card in your hand turn after turn and just destroy the game in two or three turns. It cascades so fast. Alright, now we're ready for the Mechana. I've got two stacks left, and then I'm going to go do dinner. Mechana Core, another one-cost card. Does exactly what you expect it to. For Mechana, it's get runes. Get a crew. Banish it. One-time thing, there's just two of these. The Lifebound was three honor. The uh, Void was two power. Mechana's two uh, runes. I'll give you one guess what the Enlightened is. It's something special and unique. I'm just going to throw it out there real fast. It's two crew because 
in this game, the special cool thing that support would do is just more crew. All right, back to the mechana. Big red button. This I get questions about all the time. On your turn, mechana constructs have anchor. You can put this into your hand. If you buy this when your ship is on it, notice it doesn't have a lightning border. It does not go into your hand. It goes into your deck, you shuffle it, you get it, you play it. Once this is in play in your construct tray, anytime you buy a mechanic construct from then on, if your ship is on that location, you zip it straight into your hand. Very, very effective. Some of the most shenanigans uh, things at the World Championship were because of people using this big red button effectively. All right, Steelfoot Sailors. To me, this is the most critical early one of the Mechanic Constructs. It seems a little eh, but no, it, it's awesome. Every time you play a Mechanic Construct, gain a crew, including itself. This is not once per turn if you play a Mechanic Construct. So if someone destroys three or four Constructs because you've been stacking them up, you draw them again, you play a Steelfoot. You gain a crew. You play something else, you gain another crew. You play one steel foot, you gain a crew. You play a second steel foot, you gain two more crew. It gets crazy fast. There are three of these in the game. Alright, back to a hero. Energy Nears. It's straight up a mystic. But, if you have enough pre treasure, you get three instead. Anything that's going to give you three runes on a card is highly effective because late in the game, Getting those big reach cost buys, really important. Alright, Lodestone Ace. Here's the first uh, protection card. First time a player raids you, reveal this from your hand to prevent it. If you get raided from multiple sources on a turn, this only works once, even if you have two of them in your hand. It literally only works the first time. Other than that, it's just a mystic and lets you move your ship in extra space. Extra ship movement. All about it. Very, very useful for outrunning people that have raid-heavy decks or staying in range of their ship. If you have a raid-heavy deck, uh, being able to get yourself to where you can use your crew effectively and in the right timing. Movement is versatility. Don't overvalue it. I really don't put a lot of extra value in movement, but a lot of big terms come, turns come from having extra movement. There are plenty of cards in this game that give you extra movement. Speaking of, here's another one. Tempest Turbine, when you play a Mechanic Construct, move your ship up to one space, then raid. Thankfully it says up to one space, so if you're already on another ship, you can choose zero and use your free raid when you play a Mechanic. Another note is this is not once per turn, every time you play a Mechanic. If you have two new Mechanics in your hand and you have this out, play each of them one by one, raid and raid again. Okay. Then we have our single five cost thing, the Mecha Void or Mega Void Cycler. If you control three or more Mechana Constructs, gain two crew every single turn. This is an underwhelming card. It's a little hard to set off. By the time you set it off, you've probably already got plenty of crazy things going on. I've never seen this be like the end of the game kind of thing when you start using it. It's always good to get that two crew every turn. But there are so many other cards that are gain 4, gain 5, gain 2 crew whenever you play them, and you can thin your deck well enough in this set. Uh, th this is not over overkill. It's nice. It's a 5-point card. I like it. Uh, I wouldn't go out of my way to get just this. Alright, Captain Ironheart. Here's another one of those gain 4 crew on a single thing. It also has this nice bonus. Jump your ship immediately to a construct. Doesn't even have to be a mechanic construct. Just a construct. That extra movement that you can jump around, awesome. Also, it doesn't say as you play it, it says this turn. That is so nice of the developers to make it versatile. So normally you have to resolve a card top to bottom as you play it in its entirety. You can't come back and do something later. All the movement effects in this set are once this turn you can do this. This turn you can do this. And they stack. If each card has a once per turn you can do, and they say the same wording, each of those are still individual activations, with the exception of things like the first time you protect. Alright, and then finally we have the big daddy of the Mechana. Once per turn, gain a crew for every Mechana you control. It might not be very many Mechanas, but that extra crew every turn is wonderful. Just like that Mega Cycler though, which was two every turn, 
this one is at least one without any need for three or four of these things. It, it just straight up solid, nothing wrong with it, eight points. You definitely want it if you can get it. Uh, unless you have a ton of these, it's not going to be, oh my gosh, the game just ended. Speaking of game just ended, let's do the Enlightened. Everything in this Enlightened stack is spectacular. I really can't think of a bad card having not flipped through these. The Navy of the Eye is my favorite one coster. Getting two crew and banishing it. Just putting that one extra buying power into a delayed two crew that I can hold on to until I'm happy. I can save up nine for the Thukul very quickly in the game. I can save for one of these seven or eight cost cards that give me four crew every time I play them. If I can buy one of those fast enough, I can keep the crew coming back and keep getting these other big things. Alright, here we go. Mage Squadron. Mage Squadron is a nice gamble to invest in. It's got Anchor, so it's got this lightning border. If you're on its location when you buy it, you put it straight into your hand. When you play it, you draw a card and you can move your ship an extra space that turn. A lot of times I see people picking this up just because they could draw another card. Maybe they drew another apprentice and they lost one buying power, but depending upon what they had in their hand, it was worth them for the gamble just to cycle their deck a little faster, try to get power instead of runes, all sorts of reasons you might want to do this, but then you've also got the card for the whole game. It's never going to hurt you. It's only going to give you extra versatility. There are three of those. All right, Portal Conservators. Broken card alert. Three cost. Three honor. Already a broken card. That's a higher ratio than you should ever see on anything than a Mechana uh, construct. Those are the only things that should be a one-to-one -one buying power to points ratio at the end of the game. And then it's effect. Banish a card in your hand, replace with a heavier mystic. You can turn it into whichever kind of hand you want. You can get rid of whichever card you want. These Arha Sensei effects are spectacular. In fact, isn't that already just an Aura Sensei for three costs? Banish and upgrade. Um, also note it says the word replace now instead of acquire. There are many things that say like the next hero you buy the next hero you acquire costs one less or whatever. Well normally with an Arha Sensei you break those effects because they banish something and they acquire a mystic and put it in your hand. This says replace, so it does not kill those effects. Uh, and then we just throw in an extra honor, and we throw in an extra if you happen to have a lot of treasure, gain a crew too. Let's just make this card uh, spectacular. Everyone loves the Portal Conservators. There's three of these in the game. Alright, Cleric of the Eye. Here's your classic, the Enlightened are going to kill monsters without paying for them. Kill a monster that costs four or less. Move to a monster that costs four or less. You have to do them in this order, move then kill. But you do not have to do the move. If you're happy with where you are because you have things you want to do with your crew, just kill the thing, don't get any anchor effects. There were so many monsters that cost four and had really good anchor effects. Um, like either the Stone Siren giving you a bunch of crew, I guess that's technically not an anchor effect, but Bombfish where you get an extra banish. Oh my goodness, Cleric of the Eye just takes absolute advantage of every Bombfish that pops up once you have it. But keep in mind, a instant kill card does not set you up for big monster kills. An instant kill card does not help you buy more things. An instant kill card is just hurting your deck in favor of quick, easy stuff. If you have a Lifebound Void deck, the Cleric of the Eye is a no-brainer. Take this. Those Diana's Wind Raiders that are three points every time you play them, I mentioned how good they are if you're going for a fast pace game. This will help you keep that pace up. If you're going for a long game, you might pass it over. But don't ignore this whole three honor thing just for having it. That, more than anything, is the reason I pick it up when I do. All right, High's Wave Blade. Four cost, two honor. It's already good because it says draw a card on it. You can never go wrong with anything that replaces itself in your hand, but it gains a crew every time you play it. The thinner your deck is, the more valuable this card becomes, because you're going to cycle it more and more frequently, gaining that free crew over and over. Oh look, raid protection. Yeah, treasures are important. I like keeping my treasures. Absolutely wonderful. 
Um, and this is high from last year's U.S. World Championship in Origins. He's the only player I did not have to actually play in that tournament. And I went undefeated, he went undefeated, and then I never even got to play against him in finals. It was disappointing. All right, moving on. Araha's Bounty. If you control three or more treasure, draw a card. Honestly, it's just a five-cost construct for four points. The draw a card is wonderful if you've got enough uh, treasure, treasure swing back and forth quite a lot. If you have a raid heavy deck, then this is a no brainer wonderful card because all the treasure that come out during the game you're going to be able to capitalize on regardless of who picked it up. If you are not a raid heavy deck, this is a weaker card than you think it is because it's more and more likely as the game goes on that your opponent's going to keep the treasure away from you. Alright, wave walkers, draw two cards. Can't go wrong there. Move your ship any number of times this turn. It's not just move your ship any number of spaces once this turn. That would have been really good. Move three or four spaces, get wherever you need to be. But this is any number of times. So I can move it three, use the ship. Move it another two, use the ship. This is the instant versatility. Greatest way to run away from a raid deck. Greatest way to make sure your raid deck stays relevant two of those. And then finally we have Admiral Parker. This is one of my favorite cards to grab with seven crew because every time I play it I get five crew back. It almost replaces itself instantly. It's worth five points. Crew is so important in this game. I, I cannot emphasize enough how awesome this card is if you can get it early enough. If it's pretty late in the game you might consider the question if I never draw it, if I never get that five crew, was it worth mine? If the answer is still yes, just to get the five points, you're good. But if it's like, oh, you know what? I could have bought a four cost mech and a construct and another three cost something that would be also worth five points total. Maybe you should have bought those instead and leave this big thing that no one will be able to touch easily on the board and cycle for more monsters or whatever you're fishing for with that hand. All right, let's talk one final thing before I give up on this set for the time being. Thukul, I mentioned earlier, when you step onto him, he steals a treasure from you. If you end your turn on him, he steals another treasure from you. If you do not have a raid-heavy deck, but you have the fastest ability to gain crew, a thing that you can do is a little bit of gambling. I love this gamble. I used it more than a couple times during World Championships. I would just sit on him, and every time I gained treasure, I just let him collect it. Oh look, I gained a gold. End of my turn, he grabs it. Oh look, I have moved twice, so I move off him, move back onto him, he takes one of my gold. Oh yeah, I swiped a crystal command. Now he swipes that too. As long as I think I'm going to win the race to him, I kill him later in the game, I take all that treasure back for myself, and now I am the Kraken, and I can raid. Even if my player has a, my enemy has a raid deck and they come back and try to steal some of this from me, I'm going to be able to take one back every turn, and that will vastly limit the damage that they can do to me. I like using him as a piggy bank. A lot of people don't, because it's risky. But if you have the fastest uh, crew gaining deck, you know it's relatively safe just to sit on him. Don't buy anything, don't be tempted by anything, just sit there and let your crew stack up until you get to 9. Uh, last thing I want to mention is the Buccaneer. In this set, you replace one of your apprentices with a Buccaneer. He gives you a crew and a rune. In the Deliverance set, they went with my recommendation that the card be Gain an Insight Draw a Card. But there's a couple small issues with that. The biggest issue being if it's the 11th card in your starting deck, you play your first two rounds and you haven't gained that insight yet. And the second issue being if you go really heavy on Banish, you play it almost every turn and you get way more mileage out of it than maybe they intended. So to balance that, they just replaced an Apprentice with a slightly better version of it and it's the one Apprentice you don't want to get rid of. Gaining a crew is always good. Getting something else with it is good. I don't think I have ever banished a Buccaneer. I would consider it under the right circumstances, but I've never done it yet. So, All right, that's it for Skulls and Sails and everything you need to know to just look through the cards and kind of know what's good.
no ratings or anything. I can always come back and script something and then go through that. If people are interested, just hit me up and say you're interested. I'll make it.